Hello, everyone. Welcome to our DNA Day series. It's been such an amazing day of learning. We hope that you've been able to join our mini classes today, and we are so excited to welcome Ancestry's own Nika Sewell Smith to the video, to the live. Nika is a host, consultant, and documentarian with over 20 years of experience as a genealogist. She has extensive experience researching the enslaved and their communities, is an expert in Mississippi Delta genealogy, and currently serves as a senior story producer at Ancestry, the global leader in family history and consumer genome genomics. And we, I'm, I'm thrilled because if you've followed Ancestry at all, and if you don't, definitely go follow them. You guys are expert storytellers, so I have a feeling that you have a lot to share and some interesting things uh, to talk to us about today. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Erin. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. For those that are newer to DNA and just trying to figure out this connection, I think DNA, we see at Roots Tech that DNA is one of the most popular topics that people are looking to understand more about and incorporate into their work. In your um, view of everything, what is the importance of DNA today in the work that we're doing in genealogy? I think when we're talking about DNA in the context of genealogy and family history, the most important aspect of it to really consider is that the DNA research is going to validate your paper trail or it's going to invalidate your paper trail. So it, it's possible that you might have had a family member start the research and, you know, they were working with the most available records that they had at the time. And they may have made some inferences or may have thought the family branch went in a particular direction. But then when you start DNA testing family members, if you have a family project, like I have several of them where I have distinct branches of my family tested, you can come in and prove out or disprove theories uh, that folks thought that they had, you know, that they had or they had con concluded many, many years ago. And so a lot of us are using genetics and DNA to do that. And, you know, I've been involved with DNA pretty much since it started, you know, on the market for consumers. You know, I remember back in the Stone Age days where we didn't have very many tools and things to tell you things. But now the the trajectory is, is a lot different. And Ancestry, we have uh, what I feel is, is, is one of our most incredible you know, uh, benefits of, of doing DNA with us, which is DNA journeys. And that literally looks at your DNA compared to all the other 27 million people have tested. And it drills down um, to a county or parish for some people without a family tree. So this is not like you have to go in and build a tree for this to be available. No, you, you, we can literally tell based off of who you are sharing DNA with in the networks of people who have already tested who you're connected to and where your family was from. And it's within the last 100 and 150 to 200 years. Wow, so I actually have taken a DNA test from Ancestry and I get these alerts and it'll tell me a new DNA match is found. So are those kind of insights coming up as more and more people are testing and yes. your algorithm is finding new things for me yes. to look at? Yes, and, and what I'm talking about with DNA journeys isn't even your percentages. The percentages or the ancestral uh, regions, those are all the breakdown from around the world with the DNA journeys. Those are stateside, where your folks are from. Um, I have a DNA journey that literally drills down to the exact location of the plantations that my ancestors were on in um, Mississippi. There are, especially for African-American people, there are more than 400 DNA journeys. And that's just not stateside, that also includes the Caribbean. So if you have ancestors from a place like Jamaica or from Haiti, we can drill down there to geographical areas. Um, I have cousins that are Irish and they literally can go on like a pub tour throughout Ireland because it's drilled down to where their family is from down to the counties. And so that's again, a more recent look when you're looking at the ancestral uh, journeys and, and when you're looking at the regions in particular, that's 1,000, 2,000 years ago, but the, the DNA journeys are much more recent. And that typically is what people are looking for from a genetic perspective. We want to find out where the most recent folks were from, and we want to find out where the people are from all the way back. I've always been curious, and we've had a lot of people comment and ask this question, how 
so DNA does seem like a relatively new technology. And it, I mean, we're learning new things about it every day. So how does it, does DNA detect who you were related to that was from a certain plantation before DNA was ever a thing that you could, you know, look at? How, how does it connect us to that time? So what's emerging as a result of enslavement is that we are able to see distinct communities of enslaved people. For instance, um, there's a project that I work on called the Trash 250, where I discovered it as a result of DNA. I knew where my family was from um, in Concordia Parish, Louisiana, and we had DNA matches that were from across the Mississippi River in Wilkinson County, Mississippi. And then we had them just south of us in Point Coupee Parish, Louisiana. And based on who in my family had DNA tested, I could tell which one of my third great grandparents was the source of the connection. And because of when that, that ancestor was born, I knew that it had to be enslavement. It was during the period of enslavement. And so the question became, how do I validate how all these people from these three different counties or parishes are related? And what I started noticing is that once I looked at it from the lens of my family, I wasn't making very many inroads. But when I started looking at the trees of our matches and the people who were on the same page of the census as my family members, that's when I found out who the slaveholder was. And the crazy part is that when I started um, looking at the slaveholding family records from slave lists that I got um, from places like Harvard and the Mississippi State Archives, when I looked at the will and the probate on Ancestry, the family groups were matching the exact same order of names that were on the 1870 and 1880 census. The pages were not, they were exactly the same. And that's, those were the sources of all of my matches. So to date, I've traced more than uh, nearly 10,000 people to this plantation community. And it's more than 500 DNA kits um, that I've connected back to that. So, you know, especially with, with the region that I'm talking about, which is in Mississippi and Louisiana, people tend to think that, that records are hard to research or hard to access, or it's hard to get answers. And I'm telling you as someone who is researching in these places, it is possible because if I was able to do it, especially with no knowledge of, of any of these ancestors' names before I started this, proje this project, then you can do it too. And we do hear that a lot. Where do I get started? I don't know where to go. I mean, you're an expert and obviously very passionate about this. And that, I mean, your discovery there excited me too, to think, wow, it's so cool that you can use this science to connect to family trees and all of those people. I mean, what advice would you give to somebody who just doesn't really know how to connect into that? There, there's probably a lot of people that that's their family tree, but they don't know what to do or how to get started. Yeah, usually, whether it's for traditional genealogy or whether it's DNA, you always start with you and what you know documenting that, um, you know, make sure that you're organized, create a free family tree. You can do that on Ancestry, um, you know, and you're uploading records and things. A lot of times people will overlook what we call the home repository or library, you know, for, for records and things like birth, marriages and deaths, Bible records, deeds, pretty much anything that your family has that relates back to the family, even photos are considered genealogical documents. And that will help you kind of understand the landscape on both sides of your family. Most folks do not do that process first. Like they jump in with the kit and think the kit, the DNA kit is going to give them all the answers. And while it can, again, drill you down to a county, like I talked about with DNA journeys or go back even further when it goes to your ancestral regions, people still, there's a chasm in between that. Like, you know what I mean? It's one thing to have a region, but you want to know the who, and that's where the genealogy research comes into play. So I would, I would tell folks, um, and I would, I would totally encourage people do the genealogical process along with the DNA process. Because when you, especially when you know of relations where you know their relationship, like you know that's your second cousin because you all share great grandparents. If you have that frame of reference and you're looking at other matches that you have that you don't know, you can say, well, wait a minute, my known second cousin shares this amount with me. And this other person that I don't know shares about the same amount. Well, what if I'm second cousins with them too? And it's through a set of great grandparents that I don't have the names for. Um, a lot of times, especially with genetic genealogy, sometimes your DNA matches no more than you do. So for instance, with the project that I was talking about, I will we'll get new matches and I will message those people immediately because generally their trees stop 
at like 1870 or 1865. And I have another four to five generations before that, that they don't know because they keep, they ran into the same group of matches, 40 or 50 people. And you're like, this doesn't make any sense to me. My families are not, they're, they're not from these areas. When in reality, we ended up in the three counties because the slaveholder died and, and the estate got divided. That's how we ended up in three counties. But before that, our, our ancestors were living together for 30 plus years. So that's why we're so, that's why the DNA is still there for people who were born before the founding of the United States. It's so incredible that we can learn that today from something that happened so many years ago and really mm -hmm. help people make connections. You are a storyteller and you tell all these amazing stories through ancestry. Is there one that comes to mind in doing this work between adding what you know and also using DNA to validate that paper trail that you can tell us today about someone that you know? Oh gosh, um, I remember I was blogging about an ancestor I have named Isaac Rogers, who uh, was a US deputy marshal and um, was a veteran of the Civil War. And I had I had written all these things. I'd asked questions about people online, you know, back in the old school message board days. Cause you know, I was a beginner at one point. You guys can actually go and, and search for this stuff. It's still online. And I got answers about who he, he was and I was able to flesh out his story, you know, and, and find out about him in these like Wild West shootouts and him riding with uh, Judge Parker, Judge Isaac Parker in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And like now he's a character on a show called Lawman Bass Reeves. Like they're literally because I blogged this, the actor who plays who plays my great great grandfather reached out to me and told me thank you for blogging about his life because it helped him to build the character. And so from a genetic standpoint, I had a cousin reach out to me because they found one of my posts on one of those old message boards. And she told me that her mother had told her that she was related to him too. And the names, everything was matching. And so for years we just stayed in contact. And then one day she's like, oh, you know what? There's these DNA tests. Have you tested? I said, yeah, I already knew what the answer was going to be because it just, it matched up. We had too many similar family names and there she, she popped up. And so, you know, I say all that to say, it takes some of using the old school methods and it takes some of using the new school methods. But when you bring them together and you kind of conquer your fears about, you know, forging out into something new, generally speaking, if you just stick with it and you, you maintain your interest and you just keep trudging along, you're gonna make some finds and you're gonna break through some brick walls. It's so funny. My husband and I binge watched Bass Reeves. We loved that show. I think it's so powerful, right? We have all these records and we have the science with DNA, but then they did. So I can't remember who produced it. It was Taylor Sheridan, right? It was Taylor Sheridan, right? So if you watch 1883 and 19, whatever it is. So the, the character that was the Black Marshal with with Bass Reeves or with David Oyelowo, his yeah. name, he's played by Justin Hurt Dunkley. That he is, that's my ancestor on that yeah. show. So cool. And I'm telling you, I feel like learning those stories from that perspective and that storytelling gives you a greater appreciation for who you are and where you come from, like more than almost anything else. And I think so many people can relate to that, but it's so cool to be able to discover those things. Yeah. I think too, there's no better way to learn about history outside of learning it from the vantage point of your ancestors and who was alive during a certain period and point in time. Um, you know, for me, just that one ancestor, that's, that's the wild West. It's, it's, um, Westward expansion. It, it, it involves, uh, the Cherokee nation and the five tribes. It's the civil war. It's the fact that he was a veteran. I mean, there's so many, you know, different things, but he's one of my great, great grandparents. I have several others. And so as you move through the journey, especially from a genetic perspective of looking at the lives of your ancestors, what you're really doing is just, you're trying to commune and, and connect with them in a way where when Hallmarks happen, this year is the 160th anniversary of Juneteenth. For me, I'm thinking about the names of the ancestors who were alive to see that day or those who wanted to, but could not. And when you're doing your family tree, when you're doing your research from a genetic standpoint, or even um, from, you know, from a traditional genealogy standpoint, you will have those names or you'll be seeking to find them so that the next time the commemoration happens, you have the names that you want. I love that so much. It gives so much more meaning to those things that have happened in history when you understand how you connect and fit into it. 
So for those that are watching and want to get started and they want that they want a connection story that like yours, like you were just sharing, what should they do? Where should they get started and what should they do from here? Yeah, I would highly suggest build a free family tree on Ancestry. Get started, get the names down because you do not want to miss the opportunity to have those conversations with your living family members because as years go on and you think that grandma or aunt Sue is gonna be alive to continue to tell that story, they are not gonna be around forever. So get the information and the details down now while you can get it, then go in and start searching for records. Start with records like the 1950 census. Um, you know, Many of us, depending on our age, may be on the 1950 or their parents or their grandparents are on that. Then you go to every 10 years, Follow the census. It's a, it's a central part of what we do for, from a genealogy perspective. Take your DNA test, look at your matches, connect with your matches, use tools like through lines, which we look at your family tree and the trees of your matches, and we tell you potentially who your ancestors are. At this point, again, we've left the stone age where we weren't doing that. And now we can actually tell you or give you estimations on who your ancestors are just by looking at what's in your tree. And, and a lot of times we don't even have to do that. It'll just tell you based off of the sum of all the parts. So this is the this is prime time right now um, when, when it comes to family history and genealogy. You, we really have not hit a renaissance like we're in right now. And, you know, it, it's better to start than not to start. I love that. Everyone get started. And with that call to action, if you have questions, and I think probably a lot of people are going to even watch this after this live. I wish we had so much more time because there's so much we can learn from you, but definitely put your questions in the chat. We want to know what you're thinking, what's on your mind. We'll help to get Nika and her colleagues to answer them for you so that you can have these type of discoveries because it's endless possibilities. And it just starts with getting an account, setting up a tree and going from there. So thank you so much for joining us on this fun DNA day live. And we appreciate all of your knowledge and expertise and passion. And thanks again. All right. Thanks for having me. Bye.